evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of Valencia webinar of the Harvard Real Colegio Complutense, Harvard RCC. My name is Danilo Petranovich, and I'm the director of the Abigail Adams Institute, a scholarly institute dedicated to supplementary humanistic education here at Harvard. Um, today, it is my uh, privilege to organize a uh, webinar, to help run a webinar organized by the University of Valencia, YECO, uh, Chair of Business Ethics, the Abigail Adams Institute, and the RCC here at Harvard University. The purpose of this webinar is to offer um, a conversation between students and businessmen regarding the expectations of the future of work in business organizations. The discussion we will have today will revolve around the expectations the students have about the type of work they will do um, in companies after they have received their university degree. What do students expect from companies? What do companies expect from students? What can the world of work offer young people when they finish their studies? Is it just a job? These and some other uh, questions will be discussed during the webinar, taking advantage of the special visit by two top senior manager of Valencian companies. Uh, allow me to introduce these gentlemen first. On my immediate right is Mr. Nicolas Salvador, CFO at the Royal Group International bathrooms. Nicholas is the chief financial officer of Royal Group, one of Europe's leading companies in the field of washroom furniture. He's responsible for Royal Group's accounting, financial analytics, M&A, and stakeholder relations, serving as, together with the CEO, the company's principal interface with its shareholders. Nicholas has over 25 years of experience building and leading finance teams. Prior to joining Royal Group, he had previous financial roles with Arthur Anderson, Hasbro, and Wrigley's, where he became CFO for operations in France and Belgium. Lastly, Nicholas holds degrees from SAD Business School in Spain and HEC Business School in Paris. Next to Nicholas is Aurelio Tornero, CEO at R&B Cosmetics Manufacturing Company. Aurelio is the general manager for manufacturing at R&B, a fragrance and cosmetics company with more than 20% of market share in volume of the Spanish market. Um, he also acted as CEO for 12 years there. Prior to working with RMB, Aurelio accumulated some of his 30 years worth of business experience working with IBM both in Spain and in New York and Hasbro, the second largest toy company in the world. There he was the director of manufacturing and logistics. Lastly, Aurelio holds degrees in industrial engineering, integrated computer manufacturing, and a master's in business. And it is also worth noting that Aurelio is the proud father of five children. On my left, on my immediate left, is Mr. Denway, uh, Desmond Conway, a recent graduate um, from Harvard Law School who holds a degree, Master's of Law degree, LLM. And on his left is Mr. Victor Mezacapa, currently uh, an undergrad, undergraduate student at Harvard and soon to be graduate. <clears throat> Uh, and one more thing, uh, I'd like to thank uh, our organizer um, today, uh, Mr. Manuel, Professor Manuel Guillen, uh, Director of the YECO uh, and Ch Chair of Business Ethics at the University of Valencia. Thank you, Manuel. Okay, so Victor, I'd like to start with you, if you don't mind. What can you tell us about your job hunting experiences as a student at Harvard College? Thank you, Danilo. I did a whole um, from scratch job search within the last year. So I was happy to think about that. Uh, some of the major themes that I saw in student expectations so that we can hear from uh, the young professional and then the older professional viewpoint, the employer viewpoint about um, whether you guys recognize those expectations or whether they're uh, you know, new things that are developing among, among young people. The first one that I wanted to talk about, what uh, my peers and I wanted in a job was something that we actually never talked about with each other and that we never talked about with employers, which was money. And uh, the way that we would get around this is we would look up what different jobs paid. And there was a, kind of a common understanding that everyone wanted a job that paid very well, preferably as much as possible. And uh, so people would research about the, the best paying companies and salaries and flock to those jobs. The other thing that I noticed, however, was that people almost never made decisions based on the salary 
and people had a whole host of other considerations that they wanted to use to pick a firm, an employer, and to pick a job or a field at all. And I wanted to talk about three of those things today to throw them out there for people to discuss. The first one that I was surprised uh, at how many people really focused on was mentorship and professional development. Almost every student that I saw um, in the job search, all of my friends doing it and, and people I didn't know, if I just met them to hear them ask one or two questions, one of them would, would almost always be about professional development. Uh, people would want to use their opportunity at a given company, either to get an opportunity at another company or to move up higher in that company. That's probably something that um, younger is more important to younger people, but it would be interesting to hear whether that continues you know, on in professional life. Um, that was a common source of people's, you know, my, my peers' concerns. The second major concern that I heard them talk about was what I learned the term for it is work-life balance. And this really covered a lot. Uh, people would want to know about vacation time. They would want to know about flexible hours. They would want to know about supervisor structures and whom they report to and how they sort of get out of a, a work arrangement. But I think they also wanted to know um, how they would fit in those other aspirations that the employer knew that they had uh, in life, whether it's family life, whether it's something else, what they wanted to do with their spare time how accommodating was the business to those other aspirations that were going to be pursued outside of work. There were other categories of concerns too with companies with multiple locations. People, part of work-life balance was a lot of my friends would decide where to apply based on where people had locations, you know, where companies had locations, where most of the work was, whether it required travel, how often it required travel. Um, I was surprised by how much young people thought about those things. And then the third major theme that I noticed was that, you know, almost despite the focus on salary and despite what seems like a selfish focus on professional development and on flexibility, people expressed a persistent interest in service of some kind. I at least wanted to know from my career advisors, from other people, where they thought my talents would be best used. I wanted to make sure that I was going to a job where I would actually be helping someone um, and not going to a job that didn't really fit me where I couldn't help people as well as I could somewhere else. But even on the sort of macro level with all the other students and watching what employers said, they had this whole category of thing that they called social impact. And students were very interested in these projects, asking them how they serve the communities that they're working in. And the employers really liked to talk about these projects. They would talk about they did a billion dollars of pro bono work you know, in a given year, or they let every person be working on you know, one of these projects, these pro bono or sort of service projects, um, action-oriented causes, you could say. Uh, they want someone working on one of those every year, even every quarter. Depends on the, the job. Uh, so a spirit of service was the third thing that I noticed that I wanted to throw out there uh, to know whether that was important to other professionals, whether that was important to companies. And the last thing I wanted to say before I turned it over to Desmond, who I think is going next, is that I thought that my peers um, and of course, I thought I was being reasonable, but I also thought my peers were being reasonable about their expectations from employers about balancing those different considerations. They understood that if they had a high salary, they were going to have to work a lot of hours, that it might not be that flexible. But what they wanted to see from you and from other companies was making an effort to at least recognize some of those concerns and come up with a creative way <coughs> to, to balance uh, the several that kept cropping up as major themes. So that's the view I can offer from the ground this past year in Harvard recruiting processes, uh, at least from my perspective. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Desmond, what is your perspective? All right, well, listening to Victor, I reflect on the fact that my perspective might be a little more jaded. <laughs> uh, 
So I did my undergraduate degree in uh, Panama. I did a Bachelor's of Law. So this is your first time really jumping into the professional job market. Uh, I came here to do a master's degree, but within the time that I was studying and then before coming here, I was working in the uh, corporate department of a law firm. They had offices in Panama, and then I also worked in their offices back in the British Virgin Islands. So I got to see two different work environments, and going to law school with people who were also working while they were studying, I got to understand what other people's work environments were like. And I guess I had three things I wanted to share in general. Uh, maybe you could have a perspective on it and also the, the, the businessmen. Uh, the first one is, I think this is a lot of how I was raised. Uh, the general rule for when you're looking for a job or you're pursuing a job, it might still be in the, the realm of education, the classes that you choose, play the best hand you're dealt. And that means, you know, <clears throat> if you have an opportunity to do something that could uh, increase your pay, you take it. Uh, if you have the opportunity to learn something that could get you a better job in the future, you do that as well. Uh, what I see is that here at Harvard, a lot of the undergraduates know that they'll get a good salary, as you were touching on before. So they have the luxury of really focusing in on, well, what is my work-life balance going to be like? What is, this go what, is, uh, what is it that my business is going to offer the society in general? And I think that most of the people that I got to know just did not have that luxury. And so I would say, you just do the best that you can. So on the micro, uh, you want to get the best pay that you can uh, at probably the company with the nicest benefits, the most flexible hours. But you balance that against non-material priorities, such as family, uh, maybe religious obligations. But then at the macro level, something that I had to reflect on is, all right, maybe I do love Russian literature. But I don't think it would be prudent of me, with the opportunities I've been given, to do a master's degree in Russian literature. It's really just a luxury that I think certain people might have here. It could be in the, in the United States. It could be just here at Harvard. But the, f the way that you fit with your job as an individual, which is a focus of a lot of the undergraduates that you saw also looking at the job market, there also has to be a fit with society. What does society need? And I think that there's a, a lot of areas of interest that I have that I can develop, but society doesn't really have a need for it. So I found that that was something important to counterbalance is if you want to make money, it has to be sustainable. It has to be something society needs along with balancing your personal fit. So I guess that's kind of a general overview of what I've learned and how you engage with looking for a job. Uh, how do you look, how you look at finding a job as a young person? Something I've been reflecting on uh, is the time value of money. So just the general concept is, as long as you're investing money, a dollar today is better than a dollar tomorrow. Consequently, if you want to have a family in the future, or simply you want to have more flexibility in recreation, what you'll do in the future, you want to make sure that you're earning as much money as you can today, rather than, well, I'll study that master's degree in Russian literature, and then I'll get the job and start making the money. No, the most prudent thing is to start making the money now, and that's also on top of the layer of your vitality as a young person. You, there's, there's so much you can do as a young person that eventually you can't do when you're older. And it's just kind of the, the nature of things, uh, even just with exercise, but also how many hours you can put in. I'm very sure that the, uh, the CEO and the CEO to my right were able to stay in the office until maybe 12 at night or until the wee hours of the morning, 1 a.m. when they were younger, but nowadays you have to go see family there's only so far that you can push yourself. So with those two things in mind, it's about getting into the job market as soon as possible and getting the best paying job as you can as soon as possible. What I've noticed is this is a natural motivation people have because I was working at a law firm. And you would see that the interns, such as myself, and then the first year associates, such as myself, we had to work probably a lot harder than most of the lawyers that I would see. They seem to have had this earned flexibility and I would respect that, but one of the dangers that I, I want to know if uh, maybe uh, Nicolas or Aurelio could touch on is how do you create a mentality in the people who are higher up in the hierarchy of always being learners? People are always trying to expand themselves as individuals and grow. Because what I found is that people earned this flexibility when they were higher in the hierarchy, and a lot of them would just extract. 
they weren't actually putting anything back into the law firm. They were just extracting uh, money from the work that everyone was doing underneath them. And so I think that's a little disheartening. Uh, so it's about, I, I, I put it to, to, to the experts to my right about how, how do you create that mentality in the higher ups of wanting to grow themselves? And I think that dovetails nicely into maybe the last point I wanted to reflect on is uh, we're talking about maybe an ethical work environment, what you should, you should expect from your work environment. I remember my work environment having a certain degree of just being poisonous. Uh, not to my level. I had a lot of friends that I got along with. But higher up, you'd always hear, and it was a little shocking, it's kind of like hearing mom and dad fight. But it's scandalous <laughs> for people lower down to hear like, oh, this, this partner said this to this partner and insulted his wife. And you just say, wow, what, what's going on here? And so I would talk to other people uh, or talk to a partner in the firm who I was close with and say, well, why do you put up with this? Why don't you go to a different firm? And they would say, what, what do you think the different firm is going to be different? It's the exact same drama, just with different characters. So I think this whole idea of, you know, go find that really perfect work environment is a luxury that not everyone has. And I think most people on the ground don't have it. Now, you should take advantage of it if you have it. But I just wanted to touch on that because it's something that I dealt with. And the two reflections on how to deal with that work environment is, one, fortitude. It's kind of the growth mentality of life is about dealing with difficult people. So you have to learn how to build up that virtue of fortitude and put on a strong, put on a strong face and, you know, soldier through. But then there's a long-term perspective, which is you also need an exit strategy because maybe this isn't the place you want to grow. And uh, you can see that being something quite common nowadays where people will zigzag from one job to another. And you know, I think that it's not because people want to, but it's because that's what they've been told they need to do. And on the ground, that's what I've seen be a reality is that you need to have that exit strategy to go somewhere else because the environment there is uh, not something you can always put up with. Thank you very much, uh, Desmond, and thank you, Victor, as well. Uh, I now turn it to uh, our friends. <laughs> Nicholas, would you like to go first? Okay, I'll start. Uh, concerning uh, some of the questions that Victor had raised, uh, like mentorship and professional development in, inside the companies, I, I think that this is um, a must from our side. Uh, we are living on a constant change in the company. We are, we are moving very fast. Uh, uh, the company is uh, growing uh, every year. And uh, we, we really uh, need to put this mentorship on, uh, on new uh, uh, workers because otherwise uh, things go so fast that when we reach the point of, uh, of uh, someone already trained, it's too late. So uh, we need uh, that much speed on, on every single thing in the company, also on the newcomers, and then we need to mentor them, uh, just to, to make them uh, land into the company as soon as possible and be able to run their way with autonomy uh, within the teams uh, that they are coming to, uh, to join. So I think this one is very important, and I think it's something that we, we do in the companies. I don't know if you want to add something here, but uh, then concerning work-life balance, uh, we what we see here is that uh, people is always asking for this flexibility in the schedules, in everything. Um, the company, our company, is uh, a little bit more than 45 years old, and uh, it has seen many changes during these years. And uh, every time is more open to this flexibility. We are adding these things to the to the company. People is very happy with this, and uh, we think it is more important from our point of view to to get things done and responsibilities on top of everything. And it doesn't matter when do you do that or at what time or uh, where you are. So uh, it is not a matter of presence in the company. This is not what we look for. We we really look look for uh, things to happen in the company. So uh, we are very open in general with this. Maybe uh, there is a big difference also with what you see in American companies here and what we can see in European companies. We are coming from Europe, and maybe the, the, the mindset up of the companies is uh, a little bit different uh, on, this, uh, on these matters. And uh, concerning this social impact and service to, uh, uh, that people is asking for, that your peers, uh, as you say, are, are looking for uh, within the companies, uh, this might differ a lot uh, depending on the company, on the size, on the industry uh, the company is having the activity with. So uh, 
from uh, our company in our company we are a bathroom manufacturer but we we really uh, think that we want to give back to society part of what we get from it so we are very uh, very interested in any kind of uh, activity that can help us uh, really reach this point uh, further than that uh, we, we cannot really provide other uh, additional social impacts because the company uh, is maybe a small medium company compared with uh, some of these american uh, companies and i i think that we are we are on the path to to reach this point but uh, uh, up to the extent where we can reach it uh, from our company industry and size then desmond uh, introduced some uh, some different aspects or uh, uh, views to, to to the way of joining these uh, job positions on, on companies right now so I think that uh, concerning the the fit with society or your personal fit uh, on some areas uh, sometimes it is true that people just uh, get into the companies to get the money to be able to develop these personal fits. Uh, but this is something that is there, that happens. Uh, the, the work life is probably 80 or 90 percent of your full life, uh, of your full extent life. So it, it is very important that on, on this time you can have this work-life balance that we talked about and also that you can uh, really uh, help the people develop their personal uh, uh, skills or uh, other type of things they want to do out of the, of the job. So I think we have to help to do this to, to everyone. Then uh, you also were, were, were talking about exit strategy in the companies. I think that from the point of view of the, of the company, uh, uh, in, in the past it was very common to see people uh, working for 15, 20, 30 years until retirement on the same single company or maybe two, three companies. And nowadays that's very different and uh, people might change every four or five years of company. So that exit strategy may be something very, uh, very interesting to develop from the point of view of the of the employee of the employee. From the point of view of the company, uh, we have to get the maximum uh, of the skills of that person on that period of time that we have it uh, uh, with us. But we also have to give the maximum to that person so that we can have really a, a, a fit of the two. Uh, uh, expectations uh, within the company. <clears throat> I think that uh, adding value to the company is very important for us. We don't we don't want passengers in the company. We we want drivers, and uh, and uh, this is very important because in in our company teams uh, are uh, very short in number of people, but very important. They they have lots of responsibilities. We give them a lot of autonomy, and uh, we want them to really develop their areas of responsibility by their own. So uh, if we have a passenger, uh, everything starts to flow. And uh, so we, we really need people to get on board and to take on, uh, on their responsibilities and go full for that. So we need them to add value from minute one on the company. Otherwise, with all these changes that we leave, every six months we are changing the company, every two, three months, we are every two, three years, we are reinventing the full company. And uh, so we, we need, uh, as soon as possible, uh, all these uh, skills and capabilities uh, put uh, into the company, but we also have to give these people uh, everything they need. So this mentorship, this professional development, uh, we give them a, a, a really nice project. We are leaving a, a project which is uh, very enthusiastic for, for all the people that is on board in the company. And I think we, we all put a lot of passion behind it. So we ask for commitment. We ask for this passion within uh, the things that we do. We ask to believe in our project, in our company. And um, I, I think that if everything fits, we are very keen on working with people with these kind of skills. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. I turn it now to Aurelia. Well, uh, there are a lot of questions in this, yes. in the, in this subject for that. What I would say, I would start with the work-life balance, which is something which is fashion now. Everyone is, <laughs> is asking about that, work-life balance. It's, it's very important for that. The, the truth is that it's there. I mean, people which, which are coming now to the, to the workplace, people who are asking for a job, one of the things that they say is, I don't want to enter here at 8 o'clock in the morning and then leave at 12, 1 o'clock at night, something like that, and, and been working here all day. 
Well, uh, that's a fact. I mean, the people don't want to spend the whole life at work. And then we have to manage that as a company. Uh, I can tell you that not all the companies are the same. It's, it's a question of a cultural change that's going to be there. And, and it's already happening. I mean, most of the companies are not doing that because they are not going to be able to do that on the long term because the people are going to live there. Because the people want to live. I mean, for some of us, uh, the job is part of our live of our living yeah. so uh, the one thing that we have to, to take a look at that and, and, and you have to understand which are uh, your priorities there and work life uh, balance is going to be a big priority it's already there so what we are trying to do from the companies is trying to balance that as much as possible I mean we have companies one of the best things we do in our company is that around six o'clock something like that six six thirty which is pretty early in Spain for that. We start going around, and if you are there in your place, uh, we tell you to go home, and that's it. And then sometimes the answer we get is, no, I have to finish this. That's okay, if you have something to do, you do that. But if you don't have something to do, you go home, because we don't want people there just sitting there because of the sake of sitting. I mean, we don't want that kind of culture. If you have to come on Saturday, you come on Saturday. But if you don't have to, you leave, and that's it. You have to find out that there is a balance with your life. Because if not, you're going to be burnt at the end of the job. So you're going to find out that you need to find that balance, and if not, you're going to move from one place to the other. As for the other thing that Victor was mentioned, which is something like the interest in service and all those things, uh, I, agree, I agree with my colleague here. The, the question in Spain is very different for that. I've never found anyone saying that they want to change the world from within our workplace. I mean, I, they are not asking for a job position where they can change the job. It's also true that for most of the people that we see there, they want to change the world. But they agree that they have to change that on their own. I mean, once I finish this work, once I finish my, my schedule here, when I finish the, the, all the things that I have to do, I go outside and then I go and change the world. And this is funny because by doing this, what they are translating at the end is that they are changing the world from within the, the job. But there's not something that we can do from the company because at the end the company is something which is made of people and the people are the ones changing all those things. So I'm, I, I don't know if I'm clear with that. I've never been sitting in an interview with someone willing to have a job and he telling me, okay, which is the best job I have to change the world or to stop hunger in the world or something like that. I've never found something like that. But I found a lot of people saying, yeah, but uh, what about the summer? Because in summer I'm going to go to a, to a campament to work with an NGO or something like that, and I want to have that, that period, or I want to leave early on Friday because I have a commitment with an NGO or something like that. I found those things. And by, by hiring those kind of people, the values they are introducing there in the company, those are important things, okay? That's one of the things. I wanted to say about that. And, and the other one for this month, which is an important thing now, is the, the, the history of uh, the, the story you tell about the $1 now is much better than $1 in the future. That's, that's fine and that's right, providing that you have the dollar now and that you have a future to spend the dollar. <laughs> so sometimes you realize that uh, uh, you have been uh, trying to get the most of your job. I, I try to escalate as much as possible. I try to go there. I'm the first, I was the first in my class, I'm the first in the job, I'm in the top management, and all those things. And then suddenly you realize you have a friend which was not growing so fast, which was not investing so much in that, but he has a life, he has a family, he has a job, he has a good job, he has a, a nice things that, uh, that to do, he's helping things, he has children, he's spending his time. And then suddenly you see that you are in the top management or whatever you want to be, but you, you look back and you have nothing about that. So it's a question of values. It's a question of priorities. I mean, there is no one size fits all for, for everything there. You have to know, you have to understand which are your values and which are the things that you want to give up for that. And, and uh, my recommendation for that, and, and it's something that someone has to think uh, very, very seriously, is don't give up on a lot of things, especially the family. Because if not, then you realize at the end of your career or in the middle of your career when it's too late. And you look back and you say, no, I've been working long hours. I've been doing this. I've been learning this. I've been learning uh, Russian literature and all those things. But then I have nothing except that in a, I'm in a good position. But it's only for me. 
So that, that's one of the basic things that, that you have to think of that. And I agree that there are times that you have to work long hours. I agree that there are times that you have to be prepared for that. I agree that if you are a good manager or if you need to be a good worker for that, you have to study a lot. And that means studying not only at work, but also at home for some issues and some of those things. I would say the, the first uh, honest question that you have to, to ask yourself when you're going to interview or something like that uh, is something like, what is going to be this job for me? I mean, am I going to be better with this job or not? And in that better, you have to include all your values there. And if your value is money, that's fine. I mean, it's fair. I don't think it's a good thing, but it's fair. But if it's a question of, am I going to be able to be with my family? more time if I'm here, or am I going to, to give better education for my children if I come to this job, or do I have to fly a lot, or do I have to, Th that's the question. You have to understand what your necessity there. What do you want to give up and what you don't really want to give up for that? And that's a question you have to have clear. If you don't have that clear, there's nothing you can do there. Then again, there's no one size fits all. It's a question of people and job specific questions for people and jobs for that. And uh, the, 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 there's another thing about the payment and all those things. Most of the people that they are hiring, uh, one of the things that they, stay, they make them stay there is not exactly the payment they receive. I mean, it's always good to have uh, money at the end of the month, and we all want a little bit more than I'm getting. But uh, the thing is that sometimes it's also a question of projects. Sometimes it's also a question of the freedom of doing something I mean, um, well, sometimes it's a question of listening to the people. Uh, when, when you sit with a, a young engineer or, or someone who's coming there and you hear the projects that they have and, and they, they feel that they are heard and, and they are being listening and their projects are taken into account and you give them some freedom to do things, that's also implying the people for that. And if the people are good people, you know they are going to leave. You have to do as much as possible for, for them not to leave. But even if they are going to leave, that's fine. I mean, that's real life. You cannot uh, take all the people and tell them not to leave on top of everything. If they want to leave, they are going to do that. So what you have to do is get the best of them and at the same time be as honest as to give them the most that you can give them. And uh, at the end, that's the balance that there is between a company and, and a guy who's coming to work with us. Thank you, Aurelio, and thank you, everyone, for your opening statements. Uh, it was wonderful. We uh, have about 10 or 15 minutes for conversation, and I thought I would maybe uh, uh, begin with uh, a question of my own. I was uh, in particularly struck by something that Nicola said towards the end of his remarks, and maybe I'll direct my first question or, uh, to him. And this was the... Um, uh, the remark about we don't want passengers in the company, we want drivers. Uh, we give, we create teams, or we in, uh, incentivize teams, and we give autonomy mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to our workers, to, to employees, right? Take responsibility, you said, from, uh, uh, from the start, right? Hit the ground running, I guess, as we would say, and add value from the start. So in terms of our main question, which is what are your expectations from students? What do companies expect from students? It seems to me that what you're looking for in your hires the young men and women who apply for uh, for jobs, who you interview, is pretty much this ability to add value from the start. Yes. So no, no, uh, no messing around. Let's see, <laughs> let's see what, what you can do. That could be, of course, done in in many uh, yes. many different ways. Um, uh, would you like to perhaps? I want to invite you to maybe talk in a bit more uh, specific terms about your company. If you want to talk about some examples or some concrete yes. situations. In, uh, yeah. in our case, our company uh, is growing both organically. And Acquisitions. So um, when you grow uh, organically, you can have X percentage of growth every year. Of growth every year, and it can be harder or not harder, but you can really follow it. But when you grow through acquisitions, uh, then the the cake gets very big too quick, mm -hmm. and uh, and there uh, you don't have uh, too much time to to really spend on on providing training to to the people. So you need everybody to be on board very quickly to uh, to know and understand what their responsibilities are from uh, the, the starting uh, moment. And uh, uh, you really need to get those skills from the beginning. So we, we went through this because we are hiring people uh, 
uh, in these last years uh, just to, to help us um, with this growth that we are following in the company. In, uh, in my case, for example, we, we hired a, a controller for, uh, for the group and um, we just looked for, uh, for these uh, skills already on the person that we had to hire. So it was already someone that had worked with uh, different affiliated companies, uh, uh, someone that had worked on uh, similar environments to ours, and, um, and this is what we really look for. We, we, we need to have from the first moment the people really aligned to what we are and uh, align to what we expect and the responsibilities that we give to them. And I think there is also very, very important uh, one of the points that was raised by Aurelio concerning the values. We, we also need these people to, to really attach to the values of the company. And this is something that very rarely uh, someone will ask in an interview. And, uh, and I think it's uh, something which is also key for, for these people because otherwise they, they can either they can make the mistake or joining the wrong company or we can make the mistake or uh, having on board the wrong uh, person. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Desmond or Victor, did you uh, want to uh, respond perhaps to anything or uh, have any follow-up uh, remarks? I did. <laughs> One thing I wanted to pick out was something that I wanted, I think, a little more from with companies, employers, prospective employers, um, which was that there was a lot of, for instance, what Desmond said about extracting the maximum possible value from the job while you're young so that you can invest it. I think it's, it's true that people had other priorities that they wanted to also extract from their life and be doing other things while they're young so that they can enjoy those friends or that family for longer. Uh, and I thought that was, that was important, and that's a lot of the reason I think driving the work-life balance concern is they want to use the, the support from the job to go pursue those opportunities. But I was frustrated with the amount that the companies would uh, say that they were making a good impact in a community uh, based on one or two projects. So they say, we have everything that we do, and then we devote this 5% of personnel and funds per year to you know, doing it for a school or doing it for a hospital, and that's good. And it seemed really to undercut the good that they did with the 95% of other things that they do. And it seemed to me like a lot of my peers were left wondering, and I was left wondering, is it really the case that most of the work you do at this company is actually has no sort of higher purpose, uh, whether socially or for your life individually? So I wonder if you think, whether you do at all at your companies, or whether you think it's important for employers and companies to have a spirit of really uh, understanding the good that they're giving to the world every day, with the work that they're doing, supposing that most of the companies that exist and that are successful are providing things that people need. I wonder if people could appreciate that a little more with the right kind of, uh, I don't know what you would call it, employee education or wake up call or, uh, I'm not sure. In, in our okay. case, um, sorry. Oh, <laughs> in, in our case, we, we think we do a, a uh, a lot more things than what we think we do. <laughs> so it's uh, a bit weird, but uh, in fact, uh, we talked with uh, IECO, the organizer of this uh, event, and we are going to do with them an, um, uh, an analysis of the company. We are going to do a project within the company to try to, uh, to put together everything that we do for sustainability, for uh, ethics, for all these uh, subjects and matters. And uh, we have started uh, the talks with them on these subjects. And uh, we start to see that there are tons of things that we are doing that maybe we thought they were not having that impact, but they are having it. So uh, we will put all these things together into this uh, work. And uh, once we have all the, uh, all the outcome, we'll see really where we are on these uh, subjects. So I cannot provide you a full uh, answer right now, but we are in it. We think we, we have lots of things to do there. In our case, if, if uh, we try to work with, the first, the first thing we have to do for the workers is to provide them with a, let's call it safety environment, 
okay? But from the point of view that the company is going to last as many years as possible for that. And, and it's going to be as stable for them as possible. The, the company is not something which at the end is only numbers, it's the people that are working there. And because it's the people there, you have a commitment to have uh, the work for those people as a whole uh, make it as, as uh, stable as possible for that. That's, that's your main concern. Uh, it's, it's not that the numbers uh, fit and, and, and you get the profit or you get the, uh, all, the, all the sales and, and all those things are fine. It's the people that matter there. It's also true that in order to keep the people there and to have a safe environment and all those things, you have to earn money for that. There's no discussion about that. But you have to make them aware that you are making a lot of things for them because you are running the company in an honest way for that, which means you are trying to uh, put as much effort as possible in uh, keeping their jobs alive for the long term, in the long term for that. On top of that, you can always do a little bit more. And, and we are always trying to find ways of doing a little bit more with the people agreement with hospitals, um, uh, teaching them or, or, or giving them money so that if they, they want to learn something, they can do that either at home or they can do that in the job, or even doing things which are much more uh, logical, which are training them to make them better professionals within the job. I mean, we are talking about all the levels of people. I mean, we have engineers, we have uh, people from law, we have, but we also have a lot of people. We have no studies at all. And then what you're trying to do is improve what they know through the professional challenge that they have there. So we are trying to do a lot of things with that, but basically the, the best thing that a company can do is to make sure that the workers are going to have work tomorrow there. You have a lot of impact of new technologies now, so the, the, some of the things that you have there also is to, to try to understand how you put those technologies in there without taking the people out. And that's a tough question also, because if you don't do that, the risk that you have also is that you are going to have to close the factory or something like that. So it's, it's not an easy question. But I would say that the, the main focus of the management, the main focus of the people that are working in, in the company is trying to keep the company alive as much as possible in a good environment. I mean, do, do not misunderstand me with that. I mean, it's not keeping the company alive no matter what. It's keeping the company alive so we can all be there, and if possible, it has to grow. And then you are going to get more jobs there. You are going to have more work for the people. You are going to hire people. I mean, one of the of the things that we had uh, uh, in the in the meeting we have in, in Christmas with all the company, where the, the, the president was saying something there, and uh, it was like something like uh, playing with the words in Spanish, but it was something like we are going to give more jobs for you, something like that, between job and work and all those things. So the main idea of a company or, or the company that we are trying to represent with that is to make that your job is going to be as safe as possible for that and no one knows what's going to happen in the future. But you have to act for that. So I would say that's, that the first part of, you call it SCR, I think, uh, social corporate responsibility or something like that, yeah, yeah. that's the first step there. And on top of that, you can build everything. It doesn't make sense if you do a lot of things for your people and then their jobs are in danger. I mean, the first thing you have to do is make sure that the jobs are fine. And on top of that, you build, and we, we are building a lot of things like t uh, trying to train them for, for other skills other than professional skills or trying to take care of, of their health by not smoking or taking care of the elders that they have or their children and all those things. But the first one is the job in the future. Believe it or not, we're uh, almost at the end. We've been going for 40 minutes, but let me also uh, invite maybe Desmond if he wants to follow up or, or, or say anything else in the second round or anyone else, final uh, closing remarks perhaps before we wrap up. Maybe it's a nice way to, to wrap up uh, because I did kind of maybe air certain grievances with uh, work environments that I was either in direct contact with or uh, indirectly hearing other people and other, from other places. But I think you said it really well, Nicholas, and it really resonated with Danilo, uh, the language of we want drivers, not passengers. Well, I think that a lot of people work hard, really hard, so that they can be passengers in the future. They have the wrong mentality. And the reality is that there is a lot of passengers currently. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and so how how do I guess to put it more practically, uh, what would you say to Victor and myself if we go out, we get the uh, new job, and we see a lot of passengers? What are we supposed to do in that environment? Because not every company has the uh, management at the top who is as thoughtful as both of yourselves and perhaps the other business people who would associate with an association such as a Yeko. So what, what would be your advice to young people such as ourselves in when you do see a lot of passengers, how much should you stay there? Should you try to change the environment? Or is that when you need to find a different place? I mean, every company is different. So you, first of all, you should try to understand whether you need the passengers there or not, <laughs> because it might be a, a need for the company on that, uh, on that stage. But um, at, at the end, as teams, uh, we are what those teams are. If the teams are good, if the teams are made of drivers, you will be a, a good uh, professional on your area. So if you think those teams are slowing down uh, that train or bus or whatever, uh, you should do something. You should do something. But uh, leaving is like, a, a, I, I don't know, a closing your eyes and not seeing things. But you should try to do something to change it. Absolutely. I, w I would say uh, you have to try to change that. I mean, there's no way you have to adapt yourself to the situation and be a passenger rather than a driver. But uh, it's a question of the circumstances. All, all the things equal, I would say, leave. I mean, if you cannot change that, yeah. especially if you are young enough to, to change things. And, and I'm talking if you can leave, because there are a lot of circumstances where you want to be a driver and you cannot do that, because you have to stay in that job, because you need a job, or you need something, or you have familiar problems, or whatever. I mean, there are a lot of circumstances with that. But all the things equal, if you can leave, leave. Because being, being a passenger is something that you get used to that, you get used to that, and, and then you justify that, well, at least, I mean, you need to have a passenger or two in a company and all those things, and then you're losing your focus. And then suddenly someone says, you have been a, a passenger for a long time and we need drivers for that. And you don't learn from one day to the other. You don't learn to be a driver for that. So the thing is, you have to push, you have to be always pushing for that. And, and, and it's clear, I mean, that there's not a perfect job for that. I mean, no one is going to be, oh, you are a driver and everybody is going to follow you with that. You have to keep on trying things, on doing things, uh, new things, on learning how to drive one thing or the other. But my advice would be, if you can leave that company, leave that, especially when you're uh, too young for that. I mean, leave that and try to look a place where you can develop all your skills and all those things and you can help. But also that the company can help you to be a better person for that. Whatever better person is, okay, that, that's up to you. Well, thank you very much, Aurelio, Nicholas, Desmond, and Victor. This was very uh, informative, and uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your practical insight and your expectations from the young men uh, uh, as well. Um, but also, uh, I just want to make one final comment. I believe it was Nicholas who mentioned the idea of mindset or I guess what the French call is mentality, mentalité, how it's mm -hmm. maybe different in different uh, contexts, different companies, different cultures or so. Well, if you're interested in learning more about macro perspective, not necessarily uh, individual firms or individual people, visit the Abigail Adams website, www.aaicambridge.org, where we offer a course called Capital and the Good Life, where we teach varieties of capitalism, whether it's North American, Latin American, European context. And there you can learn more about the macro uh, situation or the macro um, context rather than just you know, the, the firm or the individual mm -hmm. context. So that will nicely uh, complement um, some of the insights that we've learned here today. Thank you again, Yeko. Thank you, University of Valencia. Thank you to our participants. Thank you.